All right, why don't you show them how you can dehusk a coconut? You want to do that? How's it growing? We'll get to see Wesley's remarkable ability to open coconuts by himself. By himself? That is impressive. I can't wait to see that. You know what else is remarkable? Wesley's parents, Amanda and James Pike, with their 2.6 acre food forest, and they are passionate about inspiring and empowering people to grow their own organic food. That sounds familiar. And it's also remarkable that their food forest requires no irrigation. Wait, 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 no irrigation? Yeah, and I've been receiving questions from viewers about how to start a food forest. And who better to ask than Amanda Pike, the author of Transforming Florida Yards, a regional food forest guide. I am so impressed with her and the work that she's doing. And whether you have a small or large property, Amanda will guide us through the process in this first of a two-part series. Oh yeah, this is a two-part series. Yeah, basically she'll talk about starting a food for us in this, and in the next episode, she and James, her husband, will give us the Pike Food Forest Tour. Now, where were we? But that's it. That must hit. Yep, here we go. We're in here. Look at that. How beautiful. Here in South Florida, many places in Florida, houses are built up on a mound. When gardeners move to Florida from another state, they quickly learn how things are very different here. And we see this a lot on social media. So first I wanted to hear what advice Amanda has for them. So if somebody is moving down from say the North, New York, like I did, cause I moved here from New York, um, they're on a whole new gardening adventure. Down here, it's, I joke that I'm solar powered. And so I have this opportunity to garden all year long, not just three months. I don't need supplemental irrigation the soil, the native soil is just fine. So many things will grow. And so as you come closer to the equator, the quantity of plants, the variety of things you can grow just increases. And that is a whole new ball game. You're not limited to these European annuals that are going to be nutrient intensive and a lot of labor to constantly weed and irrigate. So let the adventure begin. It's going to be a lot of fun. The next question I asked Amanda comes from Juan in Palm City. And he said that they just purchased five acres and want to start a food forest. And so he's asking for some advice. So if somebody wants to create a food forest, which is the most natural style of gardening in an ecosystem like this, where it's warm all year round, you have abundant rainfall, um, all you need is just to get out there and nurture. So one of the main steps is just to get to know the land you're about to develop and reforest. So a food forest is a forest. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to start in the rainy season, which is a pretty obvious season in Florida. And so you're going to likely have puddles. Uh, you may have um, holding water. And the easiest thing is just to get a can of spray paint and spray paint around where those puddles are. And now you know where you're going to have water retention and you plant your thirsty plants there. So generally a plant with broad leaves is thirsty. Banana, malanga, things like sugar cane. These things are very thirsty, even sweet potato. So you plant those there, they'll help to soak up the water and you layer them with mulch. And that also retains the moisture for the dry season. Well, then the next extreme climate is going to be in the dry season, which can come with mild, moderate, or even severe drought. And so things, if you don't have irrigation, and I recommend turning your irrigation off so you can actually get to know the land, is to notice where your dieback is. So if you have grass that's turning brown, or you've got patches of bare soil and you're not sure why, or that sod is just not doing great in this one particular area, well, that is your desert area. And so you'll spray paint around that and you will plant your drought friendly crops. 
That can be anything from cassava to pigeon pea, but also a lot of fruit trees, including things like cashew. So many things will do fine in poor soil, dry conditions. You could do things like uh, dragon fruit, Nepali cactus, even pineapple, agave, all these are edibles and just so fun to do. And so in a single yard, you're going to have a lot of topography where the soil is just bumpy and either holding water or not. And then come spring, you know your extremes. I suggest not mowing for a couple of weeks. For most of us, this is just the most outrageous idea, right? Let go of the control. But yeah, don't mow for a couple of weeks. And basically you're gonna notice quickly where you have wildflowers. And this is gonna tell you a lot about the fertility of the soil. Flowers indicate a lot of things. Well, it has enough sun to produce a flower. Also, flowers need specific nutrients. And guess what else has flowers? Well, fruit trees, in order to have fruit or even nuts, you need a flower. So you'll just use those wildflowers as your companion crops and plant your your larger fruit tree is there. And usually, typically, wildflowers also indicate well-draining soil. So you've got everything you need for an abundant crop at your fingertips, it's just paying attention. So my background is as a therapist, and so for me, the idea of paying attention, that's therapia, the Greek concept of therapy, so having a garden is extremely therapeutic. And once you do this, you identify the three extremes, well now you can start to do companion planting, we talked about the wildflowers and the fruit trees being companions. Um, and so we talked about other companions like banana and malanga and sweet potato and sugar cane. And these are also guilds. So the idea of things doing well together to produce a variety of nutrients. The concept of a guild is creating a mini ecosystem. So a mini conglomerate of multiple plants growing together. That is in essence a guild. You have multiple things together. And of course, you're going to create layers naturally because you're going to be sharing a space. So, I mean, you can tediously plan out all your layers, but the truth is you want to kind of plug and play. You know, it's a dry spot. What's the easiest thing to plug into a dry spot? Well, you can buy a bag of pigeon peas for just a couple of bucks and just stick them in the ground. I mean, that's no effort. And you can just quickly start to have fun with it, do sort of things that are not taxing at first. So you have the immediate gratification that so many of us need to have the green light to keep going and to keep trying. So in an instantly gratifying world with social media and other things, um, people have a hard time making this transition. And so when you tell someone, oh, it's gonna take a couple years to fruit, that can be very intimidating. But when you start with a crop that just takes a couple of weeks to get to multiple feet high, like pigeon pea, or a crop that you can harvest in your first year, like cassava, or a plant that everybody loves. Banana is one of the most popular foods worldwide. Well, all of a sudden, this is fun. And what's fun, you're gonna keep doing. And that's what we wanna do, we wanna have fun. Juan also mentioned that he'll start on a small part of the five acres, but that that area is a little low. So he's obviously concerned about the heavy Florida rains that we get. If your property floods, which so many properties do in Florida, then count your blessings. Because if you have a flooded property, you're going to have a lot of little problems that you can tackle. But if you have a dry property, then you've got one big problem. So throughout history, that was what was known. Drought death flood inconvenience so if you've got flood yeah manage it you can simply create islands by having for example a banana stand or a banana circle with mulch three to five inches whatever you're able to do and then you just mow in between these islands you're creating and the weight of the mower is going to compress the soil and then when the water comes it has a natural lower point. So for us, we have all of our mow paths connected and we use them as swales. So where we're planting, we're constantly composting, putting mulch, chop and drop, the biomass is building. And we're just mowing the other areas. It's getting lower. The water flows out much more quickly than when we first got the property. And the good thing is the water on the islands stays. 
but it's not stagnant. It's absorbed. So the best type of mulch to get is the type that nobody wants. So if you want to make a friend with a tree trimmer, tell them, I would love your coconut coir, your palm mulch. I would love the mulch that most people don't want. So most people want the carbon mulch, the stuff that's going to suppress growth, right? For some reason, everybody wants to just make sure nothing grows and have the mulch stop everything. And that's just carbon mulch, just like bark. And what we want is the nitrogen mulch. We want things like coconut coir, palm mulch, where they shred a whole palm tree. This is gonna soak up 10 times its weight in water. And so what you have is a sponge on your islands that's a slow release throughout the year. It doesn't get more beautiful than that. And then it creates soil really fast, good soil. How wide should trails be is basically determined by the width of your mower. And so for us, it's at least four feet. But if you just stop mowing, which is a critical thing to do, just let go of a little bit of control. It's a good practice in life in general. Let a couple of weeks go by, let things get at least ankle height. Then you pass through with your mower. There's no question how wide the paths should be. It should be easy to mow. And when my husband was working storm, he wasn't able to mow and I've got other things going on. So we asked our neighbor to please mow for us. And uh, he just zipped over, no problem. His mower, our mower is a standard width. So knowing if you've got like a real specialty mower, uh, not a hand pusher, it's fine if you do, but you wanna make it wider just in case you do need to hire help. They're probably gonna have a riding. We have a couple of mini food forests here on our less than quarter acre property where we just plug and play and see what works and doesn't. And one is especially tight. Well, yeah, sure, it's a work in progress, but I don't know if you could really consider this a food forest. It's so small. Well, that brings us to the next question I asked Amanda from Barbara here in Oakland Park. A lot of us don't have a whole lot of land to work with, but Amanda has great news about that. If somebody has at least a tenth of an acre, then they have all they need to be able to feed a small family. You don't need a huge plot but you do want to prioritize the nutrients you can actually live on. So we have a whole human race now. It's a global phenomenon that we all sort of know what each other is eating and we're tasting each other's cuisines, which is a beautiful thing. But the reality is our variety as a human race has diminished greatly and we're actually not eating that many different things. 60% of the entire human race's diet is just three plants, rice, wheat, and corn, that's it. And really, it's not as though it's all three for each subgroup. So Americans were mostly just 60% wheat. And then you've got the Latin Americans, right? It's predominantly corn. And then you go over to more of the Asian areas and it's predominantly rice. So really, it's just one plant that's 60% of the diet for each subgroup of humans. Each of these is an annual grass, really problematic for our environment, problematic for our health, right? We're not cows. so. Eating grass is not the best thing. The reason that 60% of our diet can be just this one to three plants is because it's a balanced carb protein, what humans need. You can replace that. The easiest way to replace it is to grow a banana. A banana, when it's green, is a pure starch carb. If you have chickens or even beans or a protein leaf like chaya, well, now you've got your protein. You can dehydrate the leaf, mix it in with the green banana, like a mashed potato. You can make a tortilla. So really it's just kind of understanding the nutrients that these plants offer. So for me, my top ones of my macronutrients, my carb, fat, or protein is banana for my carb, moringa, right? For my protein, it has as much protein as, as a legume. And then for fat, it's coconut. But you'll have to make your own choice. There are so many options in terms of what plant will fulfill this category. But most Americans are not deficient in macronutrients. We're getting plenty of protein, fat, and carb. Most Americans are diseased because they don't get enough micronutrients and phytonutrients. Most people don't even know what those are, right? So vitamins, minerals, and medicinals. So uh, the National Cancer Institute lists the top five causes of cancer, diets, and lifestyles, number one. So if you can just add some fresh fruits and vegetables that you can harvest year round, the easiest one, papaya. So you can eat it green like a coleslaw. It would replace iceberg lettuce, cabbage, zucchini even, and many recipes. And then when you have it ripe, people think, oh, I don't like papaya. Well, what they're saying is they don't like 
the musky kind of quality. And that's only Mexican papayas. There's a rainbow of colors and flavors, just like there are a rainbow of colors and flavors for apples. So really it's like, hey, what am I eating? Am I a rice person? Am I a corn person or am I a wheat person? In either case, in any of those cases, another tree that can wipe them all out in one go rather than combining, jackfruit. So jackfruit, the seeds are a balanced protein carb straight out. And one jackfruit can get up to 100 pounds. So you're going to have several pounds of flour in one fruit. And a tree can produce up to 200 fruit a year. You're going to be able to provide your entire street with bags of five pound flour for the year. Like stock them up. No problem. And that's just one source of a protein carb balance. And that's why jackfruit is the crop that researchers are saying will address the increases in hungers in years to come. But not everybody can grow jackfruit, regionally speaking. Pigeon pea is the other one. Pigeon pea is a good carb protein balance. It's a protein powerhouse, um, but it does have carbs as well. It's considered a grain legume. So you can grind it into a flour. I feed it to my sourdough starter. It goes bananas. My sourdough starter loves pigeon pea. I make tempeh out of it. You can make tofu out of it. You can make milk out of it. You can make bread. You can make tortillas. You can make flour. You can grind it up. It's awesome. And you literally can just throw the seeds and you've got trees coming up everywhere. <laughs> so easy. And it has a wider range than jackfruit. I just had a lot of pigeon pea I had to cut back yesterday. And that's a great feeling. It's so much easier to destroy than to create. So it's always a wonderful thing to have too much. And so creating density first and then going through and sacrificing the weak to the strong is a good mecha process <laughs> in the forest. <laughs> hey, Stack, are we ready for Wesley? Yeah. Behold, the extraordinary Wesley Pike and his remarkable ability to open up coconuts. Man. This one's a tough one. You're doing great. Yeah. The forage kids love doing this. They love opening coconuts. And they find little apples inside, like we talked about, the sprouted coconut, which people in New York will pay $60 for one single sprouted coconut. It's a delicacy. It's like coconut bread. And uh, so the kids line up with their coconuts and open them on this dehusker. This is a very useful yeah. tool. Use the hammer. There you go. There it goes. Okay, keep going. You see that there's the crack. Now move it along. There it is. Oh. There we go. Oh. That was a big one. <laughs> Tastes good. Delicious. Wow. Give them cheers. 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 Nice. <laughs> there you go. I, I really love having a food forest. To delve deeper into starting a food forest, especially if you're a Florida resident, check out Amanda's book, Transforming Florida Yards, A Regional Food Forest Guide. This is a super helpful resource that covers common questions like, what if I have a septic tank or a well? Plus it has handy cheat sheets for 200 plant varieties that thrive here and on climate. And if you're interested in purchasing Amanda's book, you'll find my affiliate link in the description below. And when you make a purchase through one of my affiliate links, you're not only supporting the mission of this channel, Stacks Urban Harvest, but you're also helping us make awesome video content like this in the future at no extra cost to you. So don't forget to tune in to the next episode where Amanda and James will take us on the Pike Food Forest Tour. And when it's ready, you'll see a link up here. And if you don't see it up here, there will be a link in the description below. You ready, Bo? Yes, live regeneratively. And let's grow together. Mm -hmm.